Okay, well, uh, welcome all. We're going to be talking today about the Industrial Revolution and its impact on urbanization and transportation. The major question that we're going to be looking at over the course of this lecture is going to be how does the Industrial Revolution change society? And by that we're talking really largely about how does it impact how people uh, live in cities, the conditions of the cities, and so on. There's going to be a second video that I'm going to do uh, at the end of this one that I'll look at some documents and some questions that you guys will be covering uh, when we, while you do your assignments. So the first major development of the Industrial Revolution is the steam engine. So in the mid-1760s, you have a guy named James Watt who, through a bunch of tinkering and different work in... Um, with uh, an already existing steam engine, he winds up developing an important portion of the steam engine. So if you look at the image on the right-hand side of the screen, there is this compressor unit here that you create the steam boiling water here, and it goes into a separate compressor unit to push the steam up. And that's really where, where Watts ingenuity and, and brilliance really comes into, into play here. So what Watt was able to do was revolutionize the technology needed to move the mechanical arm on machinery and then that helped move factories away from rivers, right? So before the Industrial Revolution, most of the power used to generate mechanical power in factories was water power. So you would put your factory next to you put your factory next to a stream or a river, and then that water wheel would turn your your mechanical arms. Well, what happens in the Industrial Revolution is now James Watt revolutionizes the steam engine, and that helps move the steam engine, move the factories, excuse me, away from streams and, and rivers, now can be more centralized into towns and villages. Once you do that, now you can hook up the steam engine to anything. And you can hook it up to the flying gen, uh, the spinning jenny, the flying wheel, all of these different, all of these different technologies used in the textile industry now can be hooked up to the steam engine and help create quicker mechanization and power. This is also significant because what you have happening here is what you have happening here is that you are making an industry, the textile industry, that is going to boom, right? Because everybody needs clothing. And this is going to be something that is going to allow a lot of people to get jobs, but also a lot of people to buy new clothing because everybody needs them. Uh, this also leads to technological unemployment, right? Uh, one of the things that happens here is because there are less people who are needed to produce textile goods, we know that there is then uh, people who lose their jobs because of this. And that obviously is true um, across the board. So now that you've moved the factories away from, now that you moved the factories away from uh, rivers and streams, and you've put them into more central locations such as towns and other places, you now have the booming population. One of the things that happens uh, in the Industrial Revolution is mass urbanization, but even more importantly, there's this really unknown phenomenon that we that really can't be explained more than it just happens because of the Industrial Revolution. So in the 17 from 1750 to about 1850, the global population doubles in size. Now, there's a couple of reasons that we can sort of piece together for that. One is better agriculture, and one of the things we talked about earlier was that there was growing uh, agricultural production uh, because of the agricultural revolution, the enclosure movement, and other things that meant that less people were needed to grow the same number of crops. And then what happens as a result of that is you also have... Um, you also have 
more people growing because of global peace relatively, right? There are a couple of major wars. There's the Seven Years' War, or if you're an American historian, the French and Indian War, right? Uh, there's obviously the American Revolution. There's the French Revolution. There are different sort of local wars that include a lot of European powers, but we're not really talking about major internal strife. There's relative global peace. Again, there is small-ish, mid-sized wars, but you're not talking major things. People have better access to products, better clothing is becoming available, so the global population doubles in a 100-year period, and then since then, uh, the global population has doubled significantly since, right? So the global population hits about 1 billion people in about 1800, and then uh, since, you know, now 200 years later, we're at 8 billion people. So there's a there's obviously a lot of doubling that goes on in there. You also have city populations booming at this time. Uh, urban populations become hugely, um, uh, largely increased at this time, right? So you look at the chart at the bottom of the screen, right? You have Birmingham going from 74,000 at the beginning of the century to the end of the century, over 500,000. So five times, six times the number uh, leads the same essential thing. So you see that the population of these different cities is really growing. That's for a couple of reasons, right? Population is growing, so just more people, but also more people are coming to there. So people are leaving the, the towns and the suburbs and moving and the rural areas, and they're moving into city centers. Um, Again, access to jobs and, and, and such. What happens as a result of this is you have massive urban density problems. So cities are growing very, very quickly um, and the internal infrastructure just can't sustain it. So cities become extremely dirty. And one of the things we're going to read um, uh, in the document packet is going to be uh, an excerpt from Frederick Engels. Uh, you'll remember him as Karl Marx's companion. And he writes a little, uh, he writes a book about industrial cities. And one of the things he talks about there is the city of Manchester. We're going to read a little portion of the city of Manchester uh, section where he talks about uh, the sort of town being segregated between working men and, and non. And you'll actually see a little piece in there about him talking badly about the Irish population, so it also not only is uh, working class versus manager or owning class, but it also becomes racial, and, and the Irish are, are criticized, and we'll see that. The other part, in the second paragraph of that piece, there's going to be a lot of discussion about sort of the, the disgusting conditions of the city. Uh, the River Irk, uh, which goes through Manchester, will be will be uh, very polluted, and this is gonna be something that will, that will happen throughout, uh, throughout the world, right? Cities are, are becoming very dirty, pollution is becoming very rampant, and again, that, that is just a sort of factor of the Industrial Revolution. People are living in very tight quarters, so disease is spreading rampantly, and uh, again, factories are, are factories and owners are starting to build uh, homes so that their workers can live in them and we'll talk about that in just a second So one of the things that you'll see here is that there's huge changes in urban density So if you look this is 1700 England and then then this is 1800 uh, sorry 1911 England, right? So you'll see that even Scotland becomes massively uh, dense, right? So uh, you're talking something about 50 to 100 people per block then now if you look Scotland is becoming over a thousand same would be true here. We go from relatively dense, right? Uh, right, but then if you look here by uh, by 1911, hugely dense populations, and England has a few different cities now, right? So you have uh, Scotland is basically the central belt, but then if you look down here, you have what five urban centers, Wales gets Cardiff and, and others. Okay, so not only do you have the growth of cities, but you also have factories and owners and mills starting to 
build homes and build communities for their workers, right? So one of the things that happens here is that factories don't want their employees living too far away. They want to have their factory owners, uh, their, their factory workers living really near the places that they're going to be working. So what you have happen is these companies start to build communities for their workers. So this image here um, is from Glasgow, Scotland. And what it shows you is that there's a there are basically little tenement villages, apartment villages that are being built close to the River Clyde, which is the river that runs through Glasgow as its major trading port. But it's a it's a place where the people are living near. So factories owners are building houses and apartments for their for their employees. But this also helps to try and reform them, right? Because now if you are the factory owner and you own the home in which your employees live, well, now what you're going to have be able to do is really control their lives, right? If they're not doing what you want them to do, you can really exercise a lot of control over them. So what you have happening then are two things, right? So I compare these in terms of the good and the bad. So the good, uh, one, one thing that happens is you have Robert Owen who establishes a, um, a, a new town in southern Scotland called New Lanark. So New Lanark is a mill, is a, is a uh, clothing mill that produces cotton and wool clothing. And it employs about 2,500 people. And about 500 of those are children. Owen was really concerned about the children. He didn't want kids working. So this is before the reform bills of the 1830s in Britain. But he didn't want people working. He didn't want kids working before the age of uh, 11 or 12. So he provides basic education to about what today would be about the 8th grade. He employs physicians so that there's medical care for the staff. He provides, and this is really the most important thing, where the rest of Scotland was living in uh, wood houses, maybe huts, uh, small really apartment buildings. Owen was providing brick multi-room facilities for all of his employees. And that was a really big thing that didn't happen in a lot of places. So Owen was really providing for the people of his mill uh, for this. and just as a side note uh, the new Lanark mill lasted until 1968 so you have this really interesting society that's developing and it, and it lasts up until the 1960s on the other side you have some really and, and I call it the bad but it's not terribly bad right so another place is Port Sunlight which is in Cheshire which is in northern uh, which is in northern England, you have a group called by the Lever Brothers, right? This is Lever Soap, right? If anybody's ever seen that. Now, this is a soap and tallow factory in northern England. And this is sometimes called paternalism in action. This is really meant to try and change the way his working class people worked and lived, right? It was supposed to try and instill these ideas. Uh, they have forced re uh, religious observance. So if you weren't at the services on Sunday, you could get in trouble. And it really had uh, sort of strict conditions on the, on the people. Finally, the last two things we're going to talk about here are transportation and underrepresentation. So underrepresentation. As these cities and towns are growing, um, England's political operation really didn't grow with it. So Parliament, the House of Commons, Houses of Commons, excuse me, um, did not change its representation scheme based on the size of the population. So what happens is in the 1700s, England is a very spread out agricultural society. So rural towns are represented. However, as cities grow and the density and population of those cities grow, the representation doesn't change for them. So at, by the early 1800s, you have cities like Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, being having no representation at all for the th hundreds of thousands of people that live there. So in the uh, with the People's Charter in 1838, they ask for that and you could see you could read that down here. Uh, they ask for a better representation based on population size. Finally, you have the growth of railroads uh, connecting different urban environments. And by the mid-1800s, railroads are connecting all over parts of 
England and other parts of the world, right? So we know that happens in the United States as well. There's two unintended consequences of the railroad. First, telegraph cables follow the railroad because as you're building the railroad, you might as well connect to the different places and you can sort of communicate between railroad stops. But also we have to standardize time. We have to have a time schedule that is accurate and good for all people.